From Little Mountain Sound in Vancouver, British Columbia, this is Lab Notes. And now here's your host, Russ Hamilton. Hello. Welcome to the program. This is Lab Notes, the Connection Lab podcast. I'm your host, Russ Hamilton. Let's take a breath. If you are a participant of the Connection Lab workshop, welcome back to the gig. If you are curious about Connection Lab and looking to hear what participants are saying, welcome and way to do your diligence. Good job. If you're here looking for Correction Lab, you've made a typo. That's a spelling podcast for grade three students. And that's a different show. Oh, spelling has two L's. Hang on. Let's open with some optimism. Let's shake off worry and despair for a moment and share some optimism. I am very optimistic about the world today and the future. I'm happy to share why. I'm optimistic because every day I get to see people choose courage. I watch people be brave and I am moved and inspired by them. Think about it. I run communication workshops. I mean, yikes. The participants in these events are nervous, reluctant, but determined. In these workshops, everyone takes a turn presenting to the group. We've done a writing exercise. People share what they've written with the audience. Some people think it's no big deal. Some people, though, are facing their worst fear. When we finish with one participant and the group applauds them like crazy, the noise dies down, and then the moment arrives. Who's next? The person facing their worst fear goes cold. Their hands are shaking. They've stopped breathing. And this is on Zoom. They don't want to do this. They would rather be anywhere else. But they slowly raise their hand. It is an act of astounding courage. And I am honored to be in their presence. I see it over and over again. I've seen it hundreds of times. And my optimism, my faith in humanity is restored every time. People of different color, religion, gender, background, then practice connecting with each other in a way that lets the audience drive the experience, not the stress of the moment or their content. Curiosity about the audience becomes a safe place for even the most anxious presenter. I'm reminded that safety is not the absence of threat. Safety is the presence of connection. We can do this, people. We can fulfill our potential, our team's potential, our business potential, all of it. We can do it. Okay, I'm going to breathe. We have two guests on the show today, two participants who were both nervous but chose to be brave and now want to talk about their experience and their practice. Our first guest is a lovely person, a dedicated student, an amazing leader. He's a dad, he's a partner, a horse lover. He's also the CEO of Mechanism Venture Capital, a very passionate and unique venture capital group, which we will get into in a moment. But please welcome to the program, Brendan Beneshot. Are you well? Are you thriving? I'm great. Thanks for having me. That's fantastic. So I sent you the one sheet here, the six box and all the prompts. Is that interesting to you? Is there something on there that kind of sparks your connection lab practice? Or can you reflect on old notes or old memories or old conversations? What's interesting to you about the connection lab practice? You know, something that has stood out to me a lot is, I don't think I've ever said this out loud before, but your advice to describe things as interesting (laughs) and I think for the for the longest time, I thought that interesting was almost like a garbage word. Like you're not really saying anything, but in some ways that's almost like the point. <laughs> it's, it's interesting. Like when instead I usually like would jump to that's bad or good or something that was almost stressful. Um, and then instead realizing that it's a tool to sort of channels stress or tame stress, uh, sort of between, I don't know, stimulus and response, you have choice. And just by saying, isn't that interesting? Not only are you kind of going from, I think it's right brain to left brain and kind of naming as taming. And for, for me who kind of, I think I'm starting to realize that I run on anxiety in a lot of ways, just being able to say something like is interesting at first, gives me the second to kind of like breathe, 
not be judgmental sort of process, like choose how I want to respond, like choose how do I want to show up under, under stress and really almost like I started to think of it as almost like meditation on demand Mm -hmm. where meditation to me is being, is practice being effortless or non-reactive and when you close your eyes and you meditate and you have thoughts, it's don't react to them. It's, Oh, there's that thought. Interesting. And there it goes. And I don't know, I found that to be one of my favorite takeaways from from all of this. And you, every time we interact a dozen, maybe multiple dozens of times uh, when I'm talking about things and that are wrapped up in, you know, some judgment of like, this is inherently bad or not, or even just sharing sort of my, how I'm processing things. And your reaction is so often deep breath. And isn't that interesting? And I take so much comfort in that. It's like, yes, it is. That's not a garbage word. This is a, this is a wonderful tool. Um, at least for me where under constant stress and definitely care about how I, how I show up under stress and I'm trying to get better at that. And to me, that's been one of the most profound things here and realizing that it's almost this, like I said before, meditation on demand, like what a cool concept because it doesn't have to be just when, when we're speaking, you say, isn't that interesting? It's like, you have a million things going on in your head at all times. And they're often stressful if you're, you're me and that extra step of giving yourself permission to say, isn't that interesting? Like, how freaking helpful. <laughs> how simple. That's so amazing. And I love that so much. I have so many questions about that. Are you, because it's almost a tonic for the judgment, right and wrong, good and bad, up and down. Right? Yes. Are you noticing it in contrast with your normal responses to stress, which is that's not right. This is not good. This is bad, bad, bad. Or this is awesome. It's the best thing that's ever happened. Is this a, is this, pulling back, observing more? Is it a, is it a reaction when you say, isn't that interesting? Yeah. Well, I think you said something that I I really like. Uh, You said this on our very first conversation and several times since where you can't be judgmental and curious at the same time. And it's interesting, like calling something interesting. And then for me, it's trying to understand like, why, why is it interesting? it just catalyzes curiosity versus default judgment. Like this is good or this is bad or it needs to be fixed or, or something else. And I don't know, for me, it's being a, a little less reactive um, makes things less stressful. Beautiful. Are you noticing it in others, or how they show up under stress and then they judge the crap out of you and themselves? And are you modeling for others? Are you transparent about your practice around the word interesting? Yeah. It was actually the other day I was working with a colleague who I respect a, a lot and I, I, <laughs> she just describing something that I can't remember if it was great or if it was you know, a problem that needed to be solved. And I, I responded deliberately, you're in my head uh, at that, <laughs> in that moment and said, isn't, like, isn't that interesting? And her reaction at first was uh, kind of like, uh, you know, Brendan, interesting is kind of like a garbage word, right? Like it doesn't mean anything. <laughs> and, and it's funny. I've heard Tim Ferriss and some other people say the exact same thing. Mm. And I, I stopped there and I, I, I told her a lot of what I just told you. Mm-hmm. Like, actually, I totally disagree. I, I used to agree, but I found a ton of value in it. And it's not because it helps you figure out whether something's good or bad or what to do about it. Right. It's deliberately taking a pause and like meditating for a moment before you do that. And then you're just giving yourself this foundation to, to choose how you want to show up under stress or how you want to react to this. If you even do need to react to it. Right. And which I think oftentimes you don't, but if you're type A and you kind of go get her, then your default is I'm supposed to have the answer at all times. And if I don't, that's stressful and I need to react and I need to solve problems. And it's just not always the case, I guess. The phrase with interesting is almost an answer unto itself. In a way, it is a judgment. It is because you're saying, oh, it's not less than interesting. It's interesting. And it can yeah, be its own fun. answer, right? Yeah. 
And that it might not be the answer that somebody was expecting or hoping for because they want a transactional response here. But the fact that it's interesting means it has a gravity to it. Oh, if it's interesting, like legitimately interesting, then I get to look at it closer. I get to weigh it. I get to test for, 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 for density, for temperature. You know, what is this response that's happening right now? Is it grounded in something measurable or is it all just collective opinion? If it's interesting, I get to explore it versus if I'm noticing how I show up under stress and I'm like, oh, Russ, you can't ever say that. You can't ever do that. And then I push it out of my consciousness, specifically because I don't want to see how I'm showing up under stress. I don't want to know that about me. I can push it out of my consciousness. And that's where a bunch of anxiety and stress and depression and other bad things come from, is the energy it takes for me to push how I respond to stress out of my consciousness. Yeah. I also find that for me, if, if, if it just stopped there by saying, isn't that interesting and that's it, that, that'd be underwhelming. But I, I think for me, it's interesting is like a, opens the door to asking why. And if you're asking why, then you're, you're curious. If you're curious, you're not judgmental. And when you're not judgmental, you, you make better decisions and you can be more objective about things. And I don't know, to me, that's, that's been my number one takeaway from working together for the last couple of years is how do you show up under stress? And yeah, this is like a, a really neat hack. I was not expecting. Amazing. Right. And being curious and judgmental. Have you ever caught yourself telling yourself you're being curious while being judgmental? <laughs> <laughs> No, never. <laughs> and we're done here. Thank you, Brandon. Thank you for your show. <laughs> Doesn't sound like something I would do. This never happens. Yes. Yeah, all, all the time. <laughs> right? Yes. Because I do too. I'm, I'm so glad you say that because that I catch myself. And some, what, sometimes I say, isn't that interesting, sarcastically, because I'm so angry. I'm so frustrated. And I'm like, oh, isn't that interesting, Russ? But I think even that has value because I'm still doing muscle memory. I'm still practicing muscle memory, even if I'm saying it sarcastically. And people bust me for it. And then we just have a big laugh because I'm like, I'm just off the hook, so frustrated right now that I can throw furniture around. Isn't that interesting? How far can I throw this chair? Oh, my God. Right? So yeah. being curious and judgmental. So how's that going? Is that a practice? Choosing curiosity? Yes. And I've, I've been trying harder, especially over the last couple of years, to, to, to practice being curious. And I think part of being, being curious is not making assumptions or being curious about the assumptions that you're making. And Beautiful. I find that a lot of a lot of stress, especially like interpersonal type stress comes from making assumptions about the other person or what they know or think or intentions, et cetera. And trying to be curious about that is again, just it sort of takes the judgment away from it. And I find helps give benefit of the doubt in, in areas as well, where you're like, okay, that made no sense or that somebody's you know, making really poor decisions or something like that and saying like, I wonder why and just being curious about it on the one hand, again, takes the stress level down about this interaction or whatever this problem is and really like finesses the like solutioning as well because you you go into a confrontation or a situation with, with other people and you, I, th I think it just sort of exudes humility when you're coming in, not making a bunch of assumptions, but you're, you're, you've also kind of like pre-contemplated why they might be in this position and you come across as much more invested in them as a person and sort of feeling seen and heard from the first few moments of what might otherwise be like a pretty tense interaction. When it's needed the most, when curiosity is needed the most is in high stress interactions, high yeah. stakes interactions. This is when we need, this is why we practice when the stakes are low. Practice yeah. being curious and using the phrase when the stakes are low. That way I get some muscle memory. And that way when I'm in a situation where the stakes are higher or much higher, my body has a memory of going, oh, do I want to be curious here or judgmental? Am I, you know, is this an interesting situation or is something else going on? If you're scrolling or just joining us, we are talking to Brendan Benishot, the CEO of Mechanism Venture Capital. And what I wrote down as you were saying that is, am I open to new information? Right? 
that's a big one. I ask people that pretty regularly now, ever since uh, I re- you said it and I wrote it down. And I, I, I definitely value receptivity a lot. And you know, I've worked with people or interacted with people who are just absolutely not open to new information. They made their up their minds a long time ago, and that's that's it. And like at this point, they're opinion shopping at best. Um, and we call it we call it decision based evidence making. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> right. Made the decision. Now I'm just going to collect the evidence to support the decision I've made. Yeah. So not only do I find those types of personalities like pretty insufferable, it's just they're don't make great colleagues. Don't make like good business decisions, good interpersonal decisions. Just don't, that's, that's not how they're made. So what happens when you see an older version of yourself? in somebody who's convinced that they're open to new information when in fact they are not. An older version of myself. What do you mean? Was there a version of you that was convinced you were open to new information when you were not? Oh yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right. It so never, when you, like right. Me. Never Russ, never. I don't know what you're talking about. Um, so when you see it in somebody else, a young professional, uh, an executive, when they are convinced that they are open to new information, when, Clearly, they are not. Do you see, do you empathize with them a little bit and go, oh, I remember that version of me? <laughs> or is something else happening? Interesting. I think there's definitely empathy there. And more so than, than before we started our work. And I think maybe it's just my personality, but seeing seeing others make mistakes that I've already made in the past is can, can be frustrating. Of course. And just realizing that the, everybody arrives at like this, at you know, the given moment via their own path and trying to remember that the, everybody's is different than, than mine um, has been, it's funny, given what I do now, especially that's, that's a, a daily dose of humility for me. Right. Is, oh, I can't make that assumption because we're from totally different backgrounds right. and get benefited out, talk about it. And even if somebody is not super open to, to information, what I try to do is you peel back the layers, find common ground and build from there. And at some point you diverge, you try to figure out, is this, is like, what does this mean? And a lot of times what, what I find value in is trying to figure out if you're making like a business decision, then and you just don't, agree on it let's say you can break it down into like type one or type two decisions so type one is irreversible you know like getting married is supposed to be a type one decision um or type two is you know it's two-way door like go in if it doesn't work go out and most things i think get categorized by default as type one Mm. um, when they're actually type two and an approach and having a discussion with somebody who's not open to new information let's say and getting to that point where you've established some common ground and now you're figuring out like, all right, where you truly diverge and saying like, okay, well, is this type one or type two? Almost mm-hmm. everything's type type two, especially mm-hmm. if you're creative. Um, and then at that point, it's all right, well, now let's test and learn and, and set this up in a way where you have to be open to new information because that's what the test is for. Um, and I don't know. I'm starting to get a lot of mileage out of that approach. Love it. What are you trying to get better at these days? What competencies are you trying to get better at? I'm trying to get better at everything. But uh, competency still is how do I show up under stress? Yeah. I'm still there. I'm an extremely shy person, like very introverted and really like unreasonably stressed out about things like public speaking. Yeah. And I've, I haven't quite cracked that. Mm-hmm. Um, and in some ways I, I try to view it as, okay, so if this isn't just going to go away, can I reframe it as a, as a positive? Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I'm out of my comfort zone. You know, person I trust a lot once told me that life begins at the end of your comfort zone. And so does that mean that I'm living when I'm uncomfortable and I'm doing <laughs> things like you know, speaking, et cetera. Um, but I, I still feel like I'm, I have a few different unlocks or epiphanies that I, I need to to reach in order to be really where I want to be in terms of the showing up under stress. And, and that's what I'm trying to get better at. Nice. 
you have any questions for me? I think we've had an unusual journey in that <laughs> you and I met days before lockdown started happening right. with, with COVID. And the traditional connection lab approach would have been me flying up to, to New York and being on stage and a heavy in-person component. And you and I are, what is it, like 3,000 miles away? And I've, I don't know if we've ever even been closer than that. Um, and certainly I've never met in person, et cetera. And so we, we talked about this uh, a couple of years ago and decided to give this a shot, kind of experimental or experiment a bit and try it virtually. And I also think I had a, uh, a perhaps unique um, goal here where was less uh, like it was really about tackling the anxiety stuff, especially around public speaking versus kind of content and audience. And from a lifetime of feedback felt like I was pretty good in those departments um, could certainly be better, but to me, it wasn't problem number one. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm really curious from your perspective, if uh, how this went kind of virtual versus in person mm. and, and what you've learned from that. I am regularly shocked at how impactful this work can be over Zoom. I say that because my predisposition around this, I discovered that I was a theater snob. (laughs) I was an in-person snob. Because I've had people for many years saying, Russ, we have to do this virtually. I work with, you know, first responders in Europe for the refugee crisis. I work with um, people in South America. I work with people who are dealing with high stakes, low money situations. And they've been saying, if you could do this online, then we could really expand the work. And for years I said, oh, yes, I know. But you'd be missing out on the magnificent in-person theatrical experience. And it is magnificent. But I had my head so far up my backside on that that <laughs> it was embarrassing. I didn't trust the methodology fully, right? I, I was scared that the methodology wouldn't wouldn't have the same or, or similar impact. Um, so I had to do all that learning. And it was shocking and it was brutal and bruising and a huge relief because – What's interesting is when you're exploring the principles of the performing arts, which are pick a number, you know, 10,000 years old, you know, some of the oldest theater in the world and, and, Mm -hmm. and audiences gathering and storytelling. And I mean, it's just a magnificent, rich history of theater. And the fact that those principles transferred fairly easily to film and then television with a camera and a microphone and quality of relationship. And we have our favorite movies and we have our favorite actors and actresses and we feel seen by them when they're on film and I'm watching a movie that's 60 years old and I'm leaning into the television set and I'm like, oh, don't go into that door. I care about the character. I care and I've seen it before, but their quality of relationship is so good that I feel seen and heard. So the fact is that these principles transfer seamlessly from theater to film and television. And that's what Zoom is. It is a camera and it is a microphone. And when I state my intentions and I say, I'm being curious about somebody right now, and I say their name, and then I surrender responsibility for their experience of me. I don't decide what their experience of me is. I'm just going to be curious about them. What color are their eyes? What color are their eyebrows? What shapes do I see? And then that person raises their hand because they feel seen. That moment of reclaiming the value of human relationship, I cannot tell you the impact of that when I saw it the first time. And you were one of the first experiments with that. And and then I lean back on the name of the company. It's a connection lab. It's a laboratory for a connection. Our entire function is to practice, explore these boundaries. Where do people feel seen and heard? Under what conditions? What are the practices? What does it mean to reclaim the value of human relationships? What does it mean to dive into the essence of collaboration and co-creation? What does it mean to connect pre-language, pre-culture, right? In this age of diversity and inclusion, What unites us before we are divided by, you know, gender and age and religion and color? What binds us together? And the answer is that we we can feel seen and heard around each other. And suddenly all those things downstream become less important. Yes, I can acknowledge your autonomy and I can acknowledge the community that we're all a part of. So that it is an epic transition for me. And now 
as I told you, as in our, you know earlier um, in our warm up conversation in the green room, I we just finished our first in person workshop in like two years. We were down in Seattle working with this great company, and we just had a great time. And now I'm back, and we've got a bunch of online workshops, and we're graduating a bunch of new facilitators. Um, they're getting certified, and yeah, so business is booming, and it couldn't be better. And the fact that we can transmit and transform this to an online experience is extremely valuable. So thank you for being in our, our, our laboratory for that and participating. And I'm glad to see and continue to hope that it will be of benefit. What a wonderful answer. I hadn't mm-hmm. thought about that from 10,000 years of in-person th- theater. History. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and I studied theater history, so I know all these amazing plays and the study of the human condition from South America and China and Africa and India, how they've been exploring the human condition for thousands of years through theater. And these are great plays, great pieces of theater. And then now we have Zoom. And can we transform? Can we practice these great, you know, practices of connection and being curious instead of judgmental and invitation and offer instead of trying to control my audience's experience of me? And having none of that, you know, infringe upon my authority, whatever it might be in the business. And so I just think, yeah, the whole curve has been amazing. So this has been an extraordinary lesson for me. And I'm very grateful for it. Awesome. I'm grateful too. Nice. One last question. Are you going to listen to this podcast? Are you going to listen to your own conversation with me? Yeah, I am. Totally. Nice. Fantastic. Brendan, you rock. You're very generous. Thank you for joining me in this. Thank you for participating. Uh, I look forward to our next conversation and go out there and crush it, man. Me too. Thank you so much. Excellent. That was Brendan Beneshot, the CEO of Mechanism Venture Capital. If you want to find out more about what makes Mechanism such a unique venture capital group, go to www.mechanism.com. You can send a ping to Brendan, let him know you heard him on Lab Notes, and get the conversation going from there. You're listening to Lab Notes, part of the Connection Lab Network. For more information about our workshops and executive development programs, email us at info at connectionlaboratory.com or go to our website at connectionlaboratory.com. Okay, the beat goes on. Our next guest is another amazing person on the executive team at Bluecore Retail Marketing Technology. They are doing very interesting things in that field. Please welcome to the program the amazing Michelle McComb. Michelle, you are a parent, you're a partner, you're a horse lover, um, and you're the CFO and CPO at Bluecore. Is that correct? That is correct. Amazing. How did we meet? Do you remember? Yeah, you know, that's a really good question. <laughs> that is a great question. I feel good about it. Yeah, I am. I, you know, I remember us chatting early yeah. on. Yeah. Where you kind of shared with me what Connection Lab is all about, but I don't remember how we were introduced. I, I remember. Come on, then. Fill our me buddy, in. Our buddy, Matt Blumberg at Bolster. Oh, that's right. Matt wow. Blumberg introduced us over a year ago. And, you know, that whole team at Bolster with Kathy Holly and Katie Berger and Ken Takahashi, and they're just doing an amazing job. And they thought we should meet you and I. That's right. Six degrees of separation. Amazing. Um, so quick shout out to Bolster and that amazing group. And then we ended up doing a bunch of stuff together. We ended up doing a couple of workshops with the leadership team. With our executive team. Yeah. What... Tell me, what do you remember about that? What do you remember about our experience? Wow. Well, here's what I'll tell you. So got super great feedback. I'm going to tell you that because it was so engaging. Uh, So if you kind of do a little walk back on memory lane, because it was a like a year into my joining of Blue Corps, I had picked up responsibility for the people team. uh, And coming together into an executive team in COVID. So 100% remote. The rest of the executive team had been um, together before pre-COVID. So it interacted together. I was the newbie and the remote one. And so um, really found it as an opportunity for all of us to engage in something meaningful uh, that we could then 
uh, come together in a more, uh, you know, like remote way and improve some skills. And then I could also selfishly get to know my executive team better. Nice. So that's lovely. I love that that's what you were in service of. Um, to introduce this work. And honestly, you know, brave and optimistic, because even though we had a lovely chat about it, you didn't know, certainly they didn't know what they were getting into. Um, no. So, yeah. <laughs> you got to kind of put yourself out there, don't you, in these workshops? It's so true. Um, so we did two workshops. We did module one, we did module two. What do you remember about module one? And it's okay if the answer is nothing, Russ. Believe it, I do remember. So it was kind of setting up how traditionally you get very connected to your content, Mm -hmm. right? And so it was actually, how do you think about that relationship with your audience over over the content? And so what I do remember was um, you had us write about what uh, our leadership, what we wanted our leadership legacy to be. And, um, And so that, was something where we all got to share and learn a bit about each other. Amazing. You know what I liked? That there was something you said that stuck with me in that part um, when we were doing the session, is you said that you can't be curious and judgmental at the same time. And I I love that because... Uh, I really prefer the curiosity anyway over judgment because then it's actually a very positive way to get to know others versus, you know, and especially if you're engaging in new relationships, you don't want to be judged. I don't want to be judged. Who wants to be judged? So instead, it's like a really positive way to look at something of, I want to get to know Mm -hmm. you audience, whoever that happens to be, colleague, new person, whatever. So, And I, as an audience member, I want to be seen. I have an appetite to be seen. So if you're legitimately curious about me, uh, some real basic need of mine is already satisfied. That I feel that you are being curious about me and I feel seen. And because of that, trust builds and and opportunities to really collaborate and co-create start to grow. And I just think that's an amazing moment. I remember people were very judgmental about their content. It's a seven minute writing exercise. Oh, yeah. And everybody's like, oh, this could have been better. Oh, I wish I'd had more time. And everybody kind of obsessed about their content a little bit. And then during the actual exercises themselves, the content turned out to be magnificent because mm-hmm. it grew in impact because everybody prioritized relationship with their audience ahead of relationship with their content. It's almost counterintuitive, right? If I want to emphasize and totally. maximize my content, I kind of have to let my grip on it go a little bit and in fact invest in the person I'm communicating with and trust my content, which I think was challenging, but wow, what a payoff. If I recall correctly, because, you know, it's been a year, yeah. there's a lot of information going through my head <laughs> yeah. in a year, but... If I remember correctly, we did it once, right, where we read our content. And then the second time we did it where we were, we did the like, be curious, look into our audience, pick someone, like not pay as much attention to the content, but pay more attention to like, when we were looking into the audience, people would put their hand up if they felt like they were being seen. And they then also paid more attention, like, to what you were saying. And then we did a couple of, uh, maybe a month later, module two. We did. Demand and call to action. What do you remember about that one? Yeah. No, I love that one, actually, um, because it was around, uh, again, um, if I'm right, like, there were games that we played, too, like, Linger Longer. Is that one of them? That's one of them. Linger Longer. Permission to begin. Um, There was, there's some others too, but what I remember was all around finding the action verbs and like pick a favorite word. That's that's right. That was actually in module one, but that's the audience gets to pick their favorite word from what the presenter says, repeat it back to them. And then the presenter waits to hear what word it is and then repeats it back to them. And oh, just everybody. Right. And heard. Yeah. But I, if I'm, it was, uh, that I think that was collecting your action right. verbs. 
so that you could, when you're engaging with whomever your audience was, was to understand the call to action. That was, I thought that was huge because when you're communicating to, let's just say a broader audience, uh, I, I use this in particular working when we did town halls with our, with our company was, are we just sharing information or is there something that we want them to do? Um, and so I spent time looking as what is figuring, trying to figure out when we were doing our presentations, what are we asking of our audience? Amazing. How are we bringing them into the conversation? Amazing. Uh, what scene did you do? Do you remember? I remember it was the billboards. Right. The catch him. Remember? Catch him. Yeah, find um, him. Find him. Uh, let me do my right. job. You know, find him. Right. Yeah. That's what I remember. Right, because that's yeah. a scene where, you know, the what's her name? Oh, I forget the character's name, but her daughter was killed in the movie mm-hmm. and the cops weren't uh-huh. finding them. And it's like, you know, and he just wants you to take down the billboards. Yeah, and he's like, come on, you're causing a lot of noise. Oh, and you, you and drill like, the hole. I'm doing stuff. With a yeah, dentist's like, thumb. <laughs> right? <laughs> well, that wasn't me. Is that what he said? That wasn't me. Oh, my yeah. goodness. But his call to action was let it go for your own health. For the good of the town, for the memory of your daughter, let it go. And your call to action was find him. I'll take care of the rest. All you need to do is find him. Find him. And this was, let me do my job. Right. (laughs) And the tension in that scene was so good. Everybody became such good actors because the quality of relationship was so good between the actors. Does your partner feel seen and heard? Right, So all of a sudden, call to action and demand only become available as tools when your audience feels seen and heard. That's why those modules happen one after the other. Because we're swimming in demands, but our audiences don't always feel seen and heard. In fact, quite rarely do they feel seen and heard. Well, I also think part of it is, are you clear? Because in some of the role plays, whatever, you could get very good clarity in what that call to action is, right? And so you could check it against, are you being clear? Do you know your call to action? Or are you beating around the bush? Are you being vague? You know, and therefore that's the message you're sending out to your audience, right? Which is, I don't know what I'm asking you. Exactly. If you're just joining us or scrolling around a bit, we are talking to Michelle McComb, the Chief Financial Officer and Chief People Officer at Bluecore Retail Marketing Technology. Welcome back. Thanks. You too. Thanks. Glad to be here. Yeah. (laughs) So, right. When I'm giving a presentation, am I clear on what I want the audience to do? Or if not, because if you think about it, if you're not, if you can't pick out what you're actually the, the some of those verbs it's highly likely that your audience can't either and so you're sending them either vague or mixed messages as the audience what i want is for you to call the play yeah be the quarterback call the play huddle us up and call the play is it a run or is it a pass i'll let you know if i have a problem with the play but just call it i work with a lot of executives the metaphor of the football huddle right the quarterback comes in and says Okay, the coaches have come up with what I think is a really good play for this situation. Okay, great. We don't care. (laughs) Your opinion is just call the play. No, no. They've noticed a couple of injuries on the other team. And so what they've done is call a play that they think is going to take advantage of those injuries because now they've got some seconds. Dude, we have seven seconds left. You have got to call the play. No, 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 I will. But they've also noticed that there's some patterns that they're doing, right? And so we want to take advantage. of. You're answering questions nobody asked. (laughs) You're, you're turning a 15-minute meeting into a two-hour process. And our time is so precious. Call the play. And so I love that because even that's a call to action is just call the play. So super fun, two workshops. Have they, are you, are, are you practicing things differently? Is, are, are, is, there, is there a different communication practice as a result of these events? I feel that the call to action one is quite particular. Don't get me wrong. The connection to your audience is also because you have to like, am I, are they being seen? But the call to action one of 
Are you know what do we want the audience to do? Are we being clear in the demands? That one, like you know, especially when you're like I said, like when you're dealing with a bigger audience, maybe a bigger group or so forth. Um, the other thing that I would just say is, as kind of business changes and so forth, we've had some changes in in our leadership team, and therefore it's probably a good time to revisit some of these uh, tools and bring our new colleagues onto the same page. Because while, you know, three or four of us know how to do this, the others are, haven't, haven't had the opportunity. Are there people you want me to meet, Michelle? Is there, is that what this is? Yeah. You know, Russ, I, we had such fun with you before. It was like time well spent. And, um, so we're those of us who know it, right? Right. Buys, myself, Shireen. Right. But I think it's actually good to get the rest of the the team on the same page because um, some of these tools are super helpful yeah. in making sure we're communicating effectively. It's funny. I did even write down your isn't that interesting from that conversation <laughs> with you. <laughs> so it definitely um, has stuck. So that you're, uh, you're, you've got a, a phrase to invite in instead of to push away. I call it a handrail because in a storm, I need a handrail. I need something to hang on to. And so even if I'm saying it star- sarcastically, oh, isn't that interesting, Russ? While I'm throwing a chair across the room, <laughs> it's like, oh, that is interesting. Oh, and maybe I can catch it in time before it hits something. Well, it kind of defuses things too, though, even if in sarcasm, you know, that okay, I've got to take a pause. You know, it's kind of like that, that phrase that stops everything yep. from, you know, stops the chair from being thrown. Cause right. it's like, let's so take a pause. It, it creates an opportunity for me to choose in that moment. As satisfying as it would be to throw a chair right now, is that a reflection of the values that I claim matter to me the most? And the answer well, is pretty quick. I, no. I think what's interesting also though, is cause when you say start, sarcastic is even on some of these things, when you're communicating tone matters. Oh, I totally agree with that. Yeah. Well, and that's, it's also with each other, you know? So, Hey, like I said, stressful situations emerge. If I now know to recognize this is showing up, I'm going to actually be more understanding to my colleague and we'll use that. Be curious and less judgmental, right? Look at that. You're practicing. Yeah. That's so good. Well, that's amazing, Michelle. It's so good to talk to you about this. I love how much you remember about it. I love how it's kind of folded into your practice. Um, do you do you have any questions for me? Okay. So I mentioned that we did the the group, the executive team with you a year ago. We have part of us is new and part of us is existing and went through some of your modules. How do you, um, how do you level up then if, if you've got some team members that are aware of, let's use module one and two, uh-huh. and you want to progress and you want to do it because we liked it as a team, right? Because having us as an executive team really brought us, I think, a, a similar playing field, a level of awareness, uh, also of each other. So relationship mm. building So how do you bring new and existing so that we already know some of the the game? So you can't Uh start over, right? So how do you... So I would say two ways. One is I would encourage you to be coaches. I would encourage you to be transparent about your practice and and talk about the games you played and talk about prioritizing relationship with the audience and then modeling it as much as possible. So I would offer you some coaching and the team that has done it on how to do that and how to be transparent. Mm -hmm. So you can embed your work content into does the audience feel seen and heard? And this game we played about raising our hand when we felt seen and giving each other real-time feedback. We can actually embed in some of the lighter meetings, we can embed those exercises in there. And people can become coaches of this work. Um, What you want to do is meet people where they are, though. You want to make sure that this what I'm offering is what they want to get better at. So Mm -hmm. it actually becomes part of the onboarding process. Is, yep. is work like this. So that's part one is I would say people who've gone through it, I would encourage them to be transparent about their practice and that way they coach others. Okay. The second thing is I would open another cohort to say, look, if there's two or three new people, I would 
get another two or three senior people or high potential people and do another cohort and say, look, we can actually spread. This is how we spread it through the whole organization is we do mm. a series of cohorts. And now everybody, even though they don't necessarily have the experience together, everybody knows in the organization whether you've done Connection Lab or not, because they're saying, oh, feel seen and heard. Oh, you did that workshop. Amazing. Yeah, and that's, so actually, now, that's good. Yeah. Right. Well, I was thinking that what could be useful is that cohort is part of the, you know, like, let's say that new executive leader and their leadership team mm -hmm. so that they've kind of, hey, let's help each other level up because there's new leaders underneath them. So if you think about it too, you were talking about customer, like maybe it's part of our, you know, go to market team is together yep. so that they uh, can respond to, like you said, customer level conversations in a way is, is our customer feeling seen and heard um, and use those tools in those ways. So yep. I actually see an opportunity there. Yeah, me too. Amazing. <laughs> One last question. Go. Are you going to listen to this podcast and listen to this interview? Um, I'm going to say yes, because I want to hear it back. However, I will tell you this. I do not love hearing my own voice. I think you're going to like this. I think you're okay. going to enjoy listening to this. Because this well, was I'm awesome. always entertained talking to you. So. Well, right back at you, my friend. This is amazing. It's so good to see you. I really appreciate you taking the time to do this. And hey, let's book another chat and talk about, you know, bringing more Connection Lab to more people at Blue Core. I would like that. And it, it was great catching up. And I look forward to catching up and seeing how we can uh, work together in the future because I had such fun before. That was Michelle McComb, the CFO and CPO at Bluecore. If you have any questions about the leading edge of retail marketing technology at Bluecore, go to their website, www.bluecore.com. You can send a ping to Michelle, let her know you heard her on the Lab Notes podcast and want to pick up the conversation. Thank you again to our guests, Michelle McComb and Brendan Beneshot, both reminding us that self-reflection and professional development happens at every level of a business and a community. I thank them both for their practice, their willingness to be transparent, and for taking the time to talk to me about it. I also want to thank you for tuning in and working on your practice. I hope these conversations were helpful, useful. Remember, breathe, connect, and be curious. You've got this. Go team! Thank you for listening to Lab Notes, the Connection Lab podcast. For more information about our workshops and executive development programs, you can email us at info at connectionlaboratory.com or go to our website at connectionlaboratory.com. <laughs>